Hello and welcome to This is Baltimore 2, where we show you what's good in your Baltimore neighborhood. I'm your host, Odessa Rose, and today we are at the Angels Event Center for the Authors Empowerment Expo, presented by Donnie Glover's Be More Me. The Author Empowerment Expo brought together 13 talented authors and the second oldest black publishing company, Black Classic Press. During the one-day event, they discussed every aspect of the publishing process, writing your book, traditional publishing, self-publishing, marketing, distribution, contracts, blogging, and more. Writer Ryan C. Green spoke about the pros and cons of using bookstores to sell your work. But for those who still go through bookstores, uh, typically a bookstore takes 40% uh, off of whatever you they get, they get the book rather for a 40% discount. So that's why it's important what you uh, use. Bookstores are important to you. Um, it's important what you price your book at because um, like this book is $17 
No! I'm going to tell you the reason why a publicist can be very helpful. It's just a publicist. How about that? A publicist speaks for you. It's not an attorney speak for you. It's something, yeah. It may seem easy to write a letter to a producer, but it's holds a lot more weight when somebody else writes that letter for you. You're important enough to have a publicist. You can make your money. I'm just saying, somebody else has to be on there and you know, take that call and speak for you. Did y'all get that? To speak for you. It's very stunting, y'all. It's stunting. It's real stunting. Exactly. And on that issue, stunting, all right? Sometimes you have to act the part before you get the part. What does okay? that mean? That means you have, like you said, you have to go in there like at a book sign, like you were in. Always take pictures everywhere you go. And frame them so it looks like, you know, Everybody. We got a commercial right here. Put this, put this Always take pictures everywhere. Everywhere you go. Exactly. And if you got a Facebook page, you got to do it here, man. You got to hit it hard and often. You have to have your people who are your, basically your, your, your followers slash your fans, that you want to call them. Um, you have to keep them constantly engaged. Always post stuff. Keep them engaged. Um, it takes time to build that momentum. Um, the TV and, and newspapers, they do matter. I just, I have to check my Amazon account because I have it on Kindle as well. And I mentioned at the end of the Jennifer Franciotti, it was Sunday morning, very early in the morning, 7.30. I didn't even know if anybody actually watched the day like that. They do. And I said, yeah, they do. You know why? Because I checked my Amazon account. I haven't checked it. This is in January. I sold 80 books to Kindle. Um, I didn't realize I sold that many as well. They, like, they, they notified me that they're sending me a check. Your books are going to be low on Kindle, obviously. Some people, as you know, the trick, they'll offer the list of books for Kindle for 99 cents. For free. Why? Because they're trying to rise up in those, I mean, uh, and the, what's it called, ratings? Best of them, right, exactly. There's a lot of little tricks, but what I, if anything I can say is constantly be selling, always be selling. There's a, there's a movie, that's thing I'll say, called Glen Gary, Glen Ross. And there's a scene in there, those of you who know what I'm talking about, but the mother talks about always be selling. ABM, always be selling. It's a hustle. It's a constant hustle. Thaddeus Logan discussed his commercially successful book, Hey Cabby. I've been cabbing for about 35 years. I found that most people's problems were stemming from sex, power, money, drugs, and entrepreneurs. So I decided to write a book about the subject. I have a degree from the University of, <laughs> University of Maryland, University College, and I was also Baltimore Police Years ago, 1969 to 1976. I work for uh, a good and, uh, uh, I'm dealing with flight to flight. I mean, I can deal with a person that's uh, at Penn Station and the train, uh, they were on the cellar, they derailed, they have to get to Philadelphia and they're willing to pay $300 to get to Philadelphia immediately. Uh, on the other side, I can be picking up somebody at John's Hopkins Hospital and call this person to be in the life. Being released from the psych ward, I am the primary objective was to get my money back. And did you? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Plus a few extra bucks, but not much. But uh, uh, I was driving the cab. I was, I was, I was going on radio and television shows. I was, I had flyers. I bought my product, and I, and and this is what helped to make the book number one. It was number one at Pratt Library at Penn State. It's just keep talking and, and the newspaper articles and everything you can do to possibly make it work. Well, let me ask you this: since you want to take more time, what is your contribution with the book? What did the book, what was your contribution to the world of the Let people know what's going on in Baltimore City. To let people know, to let people know that their problems are not as bad as they really think they are. To let people know that it's a have and have not, and, and, and this is what's going on in the city. It's because, it's, and you seem like you're hitting at it, Baltimore's a depressing place. No, I mean, I love my city. I'm a native Baltimore, and I never lived outside the city limits of myself. I mean, it could be a better place to live. The, the second book, the second book was published by uh, Amazon as a subsidiary called Create Space, and it's actually nothing from the book. What you do is, uh, uh, most of us have computers. And if you have Word, you get it in the best. You, you you just figure out how to make this book camera ready, camera ready so it satisfies you. Uh, uh, what you, what you send them is what they will print out once they approve But how they, how they make their money is um, their services. If you need their editing, if you need their marketing people, if you need all these other people. But if you can do it all yourself, it's actually, if your book sells for 
if you book, if the unit costs three dollars and fifty cents to make, that's the price of the book. As opposed to years ago, this is a totally manual. This was all done on computer. What was the difference? Larry Gibson gave insight on the writing of his academically successful work, Young Thurgood, which focuses on the life of Chief Justice Thurgood Marshall, who hails from Baltimore City. Oh, the, the newest probably uh, uh, author in the, in the room, and I really came to listen and uh, and to learn uh, because although I published lots of things in terms of a full length book. Uh, my book, Young Third, is the making of Supreme Court Justice, which came out last December, the first book uh, that I published. Uh, you may know that really, uh, from an artistic perspective, I consider myself mainly a photographer. I have many uh, photographs of the historical and digital and so that's what I'm really talking about, mainly in the plane. Uh, and what everybody else writes about Third of Marshall is true. If you're only the only person who understands it, so why did you write the book? So the decision to convert what was really kind of an interest of mine into an actual a full length uh, a book was made in 2002. Uh, so it took another 10 years uh, to, to, to get this uh, out uh, as of last uh, uh, December. But uh, just the getting back to uh, what a lot of uh, John is asking me to speak about, the last two and a half, three years of this has been dealing with the, the, the mechanics of getting it out uh, after I sort of finished the first year. During a break, authors took a moment to discuss their works. My name is Lane Calvin, and my book is entitled I Have Two Daddies and a Girl Only Daddy. And I have a story about a little girl because I had my own journey with a family member. She experienced a relationship with her earthly daddy and her heavenly daddy. And the book overall theme is about God's love. His love where he shows children and adults who don't have an earthly father that he'll provide someone to take that role if your biological father is no longer with you. And then he provides a way for you to have a relationship with him where he can become your heavenly father. Through his son. Would you give it to so the purchase of the book, you may purchase it from the Way Christian Bookstore on York Road, or you can go to Amazon.com. It's now downloadable on Apple iPad as well as Kindle and Nook. Or to get an autographed copy, you can see my Facebook page at I Have Two Daddies underscore Earthly Daddies. Thank you. My name is Michael Newman. I wrote a book, Meeting Mr. Right versus Mr. Right Now. Well, I guess when you get up. Um, I wrote a book to give women a new perspective on the challenges they face meeting Mr. Wright in the 21st century. I wanted to help give you a different outlook on how men evaluate and what they search for when they're looking for wives. You can find my book at www.meetmrwrightbook.com and you can find it on Amazon. Hello, my name is Yvonne J. Green. Um, that's known as Y.J. Green. Uh, this is my book. It's called The Heart of a Mother. It's the autobiography of my own one and only daughter, Precious Carbon and Green, who she was the first female to be killed in the Iraq War in the state of Maryland. And this is all about her life. Even though the title may throw people off, they will have said it to But it really is her, her accomplishment, her dream, what she did achieve, and so much more. City. Uh, it's a story, uh, it's a coming of age story about a young uh, African American boy who lives in the middle part of West Baltimore, uh, right in the sand town of Winchester area. It tells the story of a young man who's in a tough environment, but he wants to do better. And fortunately, some older guys, guys of my generation, reach back and show him a better way. And I think that it really speaks to a, 
to uh, the fact that guys, that there are a lot of young people who, are, who do want to do better, who do want to get out of the hood, who don't want to be involved with the gangs and the drugs. But the only way they can get out of that, that lifestyle is for young, for older guys, older women even, to, uh, to show them a different vision and that they can do and be whatever they want to be in life. And I really encourage folks to check it out. My uh, book can be found at my website, uh, marshallcbell.com, and it's also available at amazon.com as well. So thank you very much. Hello, I'd like to tell you a little bit about I Want My Vagina Back. I'm Dr. Pam Love, and this is actually my second book. But this book is it empowers women to make value-driven decisions when it comes to their sexual behavior. I was tired of seeing women suffering from the consequences of sexual encounters. Sometimes they chose to have sex, and other times they did not have an opportunity to choose, as in the case of molestation or rape. And so this book provides stories of women that covers everything from rape to being in an extramarital affair. And at the end of the story, all of the women are basically saying they wish they could go back and erase the memories of those encounters. But at the end of each chapter, I provide questions that help you to really think about your value and help you to begin to make decisions that are more self-affirming for you. So I ask you a question like, what's the value of your vagina to you? If you had to put a price tag on it, would it be a thrift store price? Would it be a giveaway? Or is it price? You can purchase the book at Amazon.com, or you can go to my website at www.drpamlove.com, that's D-R-P-A-M-L-O-V-E.com. Well, the reason I really wrote the book was, uh, I was going towards the divorce. I was uh, uh, thinking that I had problems, I mean, I was going through, I was going through it, you know, divorce, uh, house, kids, uh, two cars, uh, family, and then, you know, I just started thinking of all that as I got into this, and um, I found that, that my problems were not as severe as, or bad as a lot of these people's problems were out here, so I started keeping stories, I, I started keeping the journal, I let someone read the journal, and uh, I let quite a few people read the journal, and they kind of encouraged me to go on, and, and, uh, I, I really found out that I'm a native Baltimorean and, and people in Baltimore. Can we get all in, people, in, people in Pimlico have never been to Highland Town. Highland Town people have never been to Baltimore. People have never been around the corner. People live in Cherry Hill have never been across the uh, Hanover Street Bridge and, and stuff like that. So. Um, my book deals with a slice of life, a slice of life dealing with, uh, uh, like I said, they could, they could, I could be picking someone up from Penn Station uh, who has uh, the train derailed and they need to get to Philadelphia quick and they will in the $300, or I could be picking someone up from Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, impoverished person uh, in the system sending them home. So. You know, I, I, like I said, I'm dealing with a slice of life. Anyway, uh, wait, 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 my wait, books have sold here. well. Why don't uh, we do it right here? This is the first book. The first book is approximately 30 years old. It was number one at Pratt Library for 10 straight weeks. It was also number one on the Wall Street Journal. I mean, I'm sorry, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and all news media during that time. Uh, the fourth printing came out July the 1st. And this book, this my, my second book came out J July the 1st, and it's the sequel to, to this book. I'm Natima Nicole, author of More Than My Body. More Than My Body is a memoir that first talks about being molested, uh, becoming promiscuous, and a teenage parent. Um, I wrote this book in a series um, because I felt like people first needed somebody they could relate to. It's easy to put out self-help books and promote the positive, but some people are still hurting and evaluating their self-worth with the things that have happened to them in the past. So this first book uh, was released in February. Part two of the book uh, talks about adult choices and will be released on July 27th, and the positive self-help will be uh, in, uh, released in November. But my website is morethanmybody.com, and um, it's facebook.com slash more than my body.
most legal historians regard Thurgood Marshall as being the most important American lawyer of the uh, 20th century. And he grew up and was raised uh, here in Baltimore. His uh, professional career after he get, went, gets to New York is pretty well documented. What needed to be uh, documented, and really I thought could best be done by a Baltimorean, was his formative years. And so my book, Young Thurgood, The Making of Supreme Court Justice, focuses on Thurgood Marshall's first 30 years and tries to show the uh, forces that shaped him. So it's less a book about what Thurgood Marshall did than it is a book about he, what he was like and what forces uh, both people, uh, events, uh, and um, uh, circumstances that, that shaped him. It, getting Thurgood Marshall uh, published a book about him uh, had, it, trying to do that, it had some uh, uh, advantages because he's such a well-known, uh, famous person. On the other hand, uh, there have already been four uh, full-life biographies of Thurgood Marshall. What made my book, I think, attractive to uh, publishers is that it focused less on his full-life career than on his formative uh, uh, years. It was also helpful to me that uh, my book had the support of Thurgood Marshall's family. It is the first book, biography, of Thurgood Marshall to be uh, endorsed by the justices' uh, immediate family. And in fact, uh, Thurgood Marshall, Jr., his son, wrote the foreword to my book. So the combination of a focus on the early years of Thurgood Marshall, the, well, the family's support, and it being written by someone here in Baltimore, his hometown, all worked to my benefit. Natalie Stokes Peters of Black Classic Press spoke about the history of the Black Classic Press and its mission. Your paper and you actually doing it, that's taking action. When it's always in your head, it's not really getting anywhere. So for those of you who are doing it, I, I, I applaud you. All right, uh, my name is Natalie Stokes Peter, okay, and I'm the current publisher at Black Classic Press. Um, and what I'll do today, what Donnie asked me to do, was talk a little bit about Black Classic Press because it is a Baltimore, um, it's a Baltimore tradition. It's, a, it's, it's, it's part of Baltimore history. And so he asked me to talk about that, but then I can also answer questions uh, that you may have about the inside of the publishing industry. We're not a, a big New York major house with traditional publishing and, you know, staff, however many or how few those may be. But we are um, a niche independent black-owned publisher. We are the second oldest independent black-owned publisher in the U.S. Um, Hakeem Matabuti, who owns Third World Press, is the oldest press. And they're about 10 years older than us. The third oldest is owned by Casa and Chicole in New Jersey. Okay, so that's... Um, sort of the history <laughs> of black publish independent black publishing in terms of who's old. There are many, 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 many newer independent black publishers um, in the space now, which is great. So those of you who have published your own book, you are on the way or could be on your way to being a publishing house as well. Okay? It's just a matter of you going from publishing your own book to, to coaching and bringing someone into the possibility, possible space of them publishing their books with you. So once you've learned it and you've got all the tricks, then it becomes a space of how do you do it, how do you help someone else do it, okay? Um, a little bit about myself that I will mention. Um, now, I'm not a writer by degree. I'm not an English major. <laughs> I'm an engineer, okay? Um, two engineering degrees. So I'm about as far from writing as you get to college. I did not even have to take an English class. I set it out of it, and so I never had to take an English class. So that, but I am a reader, have always been a reader. If you self-publish or plan on self-publishing, to be in the publishing business, you need to be in the reading business, okay? Um, I will also say that along the way, I've always owned um, businesses in addition to whatever my real job was, okay? When I worked, I worked full time, they talked about you know, starting a publishing company, so that books could get into the prison system. He says it lasted about a week and they were done. <laughs> so um, after that, he went on and he had a bookstore across the street from Coppin, 
Um, the Black Book was the name of the bookstore. Some people in Baltimore know it so well that they still ask him, how's the bookstore going? And that's been like over almost 40 years ago since that point in time when he stopped doing the bookstore. But that's again part of that history. Um, but what happened is that in 1978, Paul started to start the publishing company. And um, the focus of the company was to republish books that were obscure but important to folks with African to the public. Okay. Okay. And as you know, the differences between a publisher and a self-publisher is I say that when you go with a publisher, you give away your, some of your decision space um, and some income. Okay. When you self-publish, you get to take some of that back. So the publisher does end up with the final decision on many things because they feel as though, we feel as though, it is our responsibility to market your book well and to make sure that we're putting out a product that is going to be worthy of Okay? Mystery is not a genre that we, that we really publish in. So how do we end up that way? Um, back in 96 or something like that, um, Walter Mosley was talking about how he wanted um, he wanted to be able, he wanted more black writers who had quote unquote made it who were a list writers to publish with independent black publishing houses so that they also got would get exposure. Okay, and so when he and Paul hooked up, we didn't know anything about the mystery genre, but because of Walter Mosley, people knew him. So all he had to do was go out and speak and the book would sell because we can't afford what the marketing place where his publisher for. Uh, we can't afford to advertise in Time Magazine or in Black Enterprise or in Ebony or he can't afford that with his major publisher might. So there are different things that happen, but he did it so that the publishing house would get attention. Yeah. Black Classic Press would get attention. And he with his thing was again he wanted more writers. Who could afford to do it? Because we don't we don't do advances. You know, so it was like, Walter, well, you're not going to get in the van. He goes, I know. You know, but we will pay you your royalty. And so that's always been a thing. And so what you end up with is a relationship. I would say Paul and Walter are very, very good friends now. They're like, cool buddies, right? And that's another power of names. But other people have to pick it up. But it's adopted in universities, using university classrooms. But there, so there are books. But there's no one else, I don't think, I haven't checked the, the but no one else does show up as a It's a beautiful book when you pick it up and read it. J. A. Rod is like there are black writers who would be who would who would who would, who would be gone from our conversational landscape. You can just hear the normal name. So black classic press will sometimes publish books that we know are niche books just because we don't want them to came to us a couple years ago. This is a book that he they did in the sixties, um, Black Fire. An anthology of Afro American writing, edited by Leroy Jones, mm -hmm. so he was still Leroy Jones, uh, and Larry Neal. Okay, Larry has since transitioned, he, he's no longer with us. But this book was initially, I want you to know that. This book was initially published in 1968 and was out of print. Okay, he came to us and asked us would we bring the book back into print. It's currently used again in university classrooms. We sell it very well on Amazon. It's sold. So there's an interest in the book. Um, and so. At the end of the day, Donnie discussed why he put the expo together. I put it together because I plan to publish a book in the next six months to a year. And there are a lot of other authors who come on our radio show, come on Be More News. And I realized that there's a body of knowledge, there's a conversation that we, that more of us need to hear. And with, with uh, Professor Gibson's book coming out, The Young Thurgood, or Young Thurgood, and learning about how much work he put into that book. Uh, he says 10 years, uh, could easily be 38 years uh, of research, the rewrites, learning the publishing. He mentioned uh, self-publishing, the major house publishing, the black publishers, uh, independent publishers. There's so many different routes to go, and this was an attempt to educate myself, and the other authors who come through 
our media outlets who want exposure. I realize there's so much to learn, and we just wanted to get the conversation going. I think it's a great start. Everyone I've talked to has learned something. Uh, Professor Gibson talked about uh, the significance of, well, he pointed to black classic press. And what I see when I look at Be More News and all that it takes to publish at Be More News, I'd rather have total control over the process, how to update my website, how to do all those. The same thing with publishing a book. The more control, and I'm sensing it, he's going to come and tell you better than I, but I, I'm sensing the more control you have over your project, uh, the more peace of mind you'll have. So you're going to self-publish? That's the way it looks. Uh, I, I'll see about following Professor Gibson. Uh, but, but also, and, and I'd love to hear his take on it, he was able to use his strengths and make them work for him in the book production. Uh, he was able to parlay his strengths and make them work for him. And it, it, it reminds me that I need to focus and find and identify my strengths, be it the college connections, be it your, the, the journalism world, but target your strengths and have a strategy, have a, have a plan. Yes. Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you for joining us, and please tune in again so we can show you what's good in your Baltimore neighborhood.